use it for his glory and his honor. I will uh, ask your forgiveness for this unscheduled trip to Florida. Um, I'm, not a, <laughs> I'm not a control freak. I just do want to go and sit in the room um, and hear what the doctor has to say. And when my wife and I were talking about whether we should or shouldn't, um, she said, well, tell me all the reasons why you would and tell me all the reasons why you wouldn't. And um, we had a good list of those type of things. Uh, and to be honest with you, I just want to go fight. Uh, I'm just, I can't apologize for who I am. I've always been that way. My wife has always told me my whole entire life that you love conflict, and I, I don't. Uh, but I don't avoid it either. And my first reaction usually is always to fight. Um, <laughs> It's, a, it's, it's one of those things, I just want to go punch the devil in the face. And uh, I, I mean, it just, it's, I remember being in the grocery store in between two guys, and one guy pulled out a gun and shot another, and I was right there in the middle. I just wanted to fight. Hello, somebody. And uh, that's a long story. Some of you have heard it. Uh, I remember taking my daughter to a zoo with my wife, and we had been to the zoo in five minutes, and we were watching the dolphins underground, and they were doing their thing, swimming in the tank, and this guy began to have a heart attack right in front of us, and he was down, and there was this ledge, and everybody scattered because this guy fell out and started convulsing, and as everybody began to run, I, I leaped over the edge and got down there, and I'm thinking ABCs, air, breathing, circulation, I'm going through all these things, and... I hear my daughter in the background look at, tell her mom, why does dad always have to do this? Uh, and so the truth of the matter is, I just want to go punch the devil in the face, and I don't trust anybody else in the room to do it but me. So, because everybody else runs away. So pray for us. Um, it'll be a good trip. Amen. Uh, we believe God. What a move of the Lord. Hello, somebody. And I'm not even going to apologize about this this morning. I am here fully this morning to violate you. Um, I'm going to say some things that I hope do. Not in a, in a way to make you mad at me, but in a way to stir you to something. Um, as a church, what we saw this morning and the testimony we saw this morning should be the, the norm that's the kingdom of God. That should be the norm. In the New Testament, it was. They were surprised when God didn't move. When God didn't answer their prayer. They were surprised when God didn't shake the earth. Come on, church. And that should be the norm for us. And today we're going to, in our vision series, I, I want to do this. I want you to turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 10. And I... I'm going to do this a little bit different than I normally do. Normally I read the whole text and give us the context of the story. Today I'm going to read the story in portions as we go through it. Now I want you to brace yourself. Everybody say brace yourself. Brace yourself. Next week. Everybody say next week. That's our giving sermon. And so I'm going to say the curse word in church. Probably a lot. I'm going to talk about tithing. Hello somebody. So not only am I going to violate you this week, I'm probably going to violate you next week. Amen. But I hope to stir you to something. Watch what God does with us as a church, amen, on planet Earth. Today I've titled this particular portion of our message that we are receiving from the Lord as we sit in his presence and together. Uh, again, why do we gather together like this to, hear, to let someone lecture us every week? Uh, uh, to do whatever, you know, if it's not for the presence of God, I don't know why we do it, but I want you to understand that I can't be the only one, your eldership team cannot be the only people in the room that believes that God has given us a vision that changes the world. Not a vision that just changes Centerville or the surrounding cities or St. Joe County or Michigan or the United States of America. God has given us a vision that changes the world. 
as we speak, we have a team getting ready to get on a plane and go change a certain area of a certain nation. In a couple of weeks, we're going to send some young people, and they are going to, they're going to change the world. In June, we're going to go to Brazil, and we're going to change some things. It's happening. Change seems to always happen. God has given, and I know I'm, I really am tired of apologizing for the greatness of the vision. Because here's the deal. If we don't ever attach ourselves to something that's greater than who we are, we'll never need God to get it done. And this church needs God. And I want us to always be in need of God. God specifically called a people to a special relationship with him. If, you, if you're just a casual reader of the scripture, or maybe the knowledge of your scripture just comes from when you were a kid in Bible stories or Sunday school hour and those type of things, you will understand that God called Israel to a special relationship with him. It was different than every other thing. It was, it was different in, in the aspect of his calling or his dealings with any other people on planet Earth. He called Israel to a special relationship with himself. They were to be his people. They were to be his witnesses. They were to be his missionaries to the rest of the world. This special people was to be a people on assignment and not a people of privilege. But see, what religion always does is confuse assignment with privilege. And when you confuse assignment with privilege, what you do is you flip the mission. When you confuse assignment with privilege, you make the calling of the special relationship with God Almighty all about you and not about those who need God. It wasn't in my notes. You might need to tweet that. Hello, somebody. Y'all, you just get ready. My mentor was here last week. He didn't preach with any notes. I mean, I mean, he had some, but I read them beforehand. He didn't use them, trust me. And there were times when he would do that with me. Hey, you're preaching on Sunday. You don't get to use any notes. I'm going to learn to trust the Holy Spirit. What happened with Israel is along the way, they forgot their purpose, and they began to create barriers between themselves and the rest of the world because they flipped assignment for privilege. They flipped assignment. And here's what I want you to do. We put this up here because I want you to grab a hold of this. When God's people forget their purpose, it's easy to make everything good about the kingdom of God self-centered. I said, when we forget our purpose, it's easy to take everything that is good about the kingdom of God and make it self-centered. Let me, let me express something to you this morning, church. Hey, amen. Listen, the modern-day church, the Western world church, the New Testament church, it's a good thing. Somebody say amen. We have great churches in our area. We really do. This area is blessed with great churches. Do we all do ministry the same way? Absolutely not. But this is why the elders have decided in this place, we don't talk bad about other churches just because they do things different than we do. Our job is to pray. God, fill them up. Listen, if you don't think there ain't enough people to fill up, everybody always tells me, oh, there's so many churches, there's too many churches. No one ever comes to me and say, Pastor Don, we need, to, we need more churches because there's too many lost people. But people always tell me, oh, there's too many churches, there's too many churches, there's too many churches. Are you kidding me? Hello, somebody. And then people say, Pastor Don, why do you feel like we should plant more churches? Why should we plant more churches? Look, there's too many churches as there are. Listen, if there's a lost person that needs a healthy church, we should be planting that healthy church. When God's people forget their purpose, it's easy to make everything good about the kingdom of God. Uh, 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 Self-centered. It's easy to make everything about FFM, about me, about you, about us. 
It's our four and no more. When a church forgets its purpose, it's no longer uh, uh, about salvation only. It, it, what happens is then we take salvation and we look at it as if it only belongs to us. It only belongs to us. Let me shock you this morning. I'm going to share a nugget with you, something God dropped in my spirit. Why do we make everything about heaven? Do you realize that the church was birthed and born on planet Earth? Not heaven. And Jesus said, I will build my... The kingdom of God always has been, the kingdom of God is, and the kingdom of God always will be, as per David Campbell's teaching. The church is the point in any given spot in history where the kingdom of God invades planet Earth. That's why you and I are not building the kingdom of God. It already is established. We are co-laborers with Christ in building. Some of y'all are with me today. Some of y'all are just, I don't know, maybe still a little drunk on the Holy Ghost. Peter, himself, a great man of God, had been taught something his whole life. He had been taught, don't have anything to do with Gentiles. Don't have anything to do with Gentiles. If you even touch one accidentally, you've got to go home and wash yourself. Think about what would have happened if that attitude would have been allowed to remain in the church. So God's got something to do here because one of his main guys who's a co laborer with Christ who's helping him build the church has got this attitude that he can't have anything to do with Gentiles. And so God's got to deal with this attitude. He's got to deal with this issue because if that is allowed to permeate into what he's building on earth, there are some people who are going to get left out. We flipped privilege for assignment. Come on, come on. There's no greater privilege than what Peter had in walking with Jesus Christ in the flesh. No greater. Think about this. It would have been devastating to the spread of the gospel if this would have been allowed. Large areas of the world will never have heard about Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has been doing something in Peter's life up to chapter 10. He's been working in Peter's life, right? And he's been taking Peter from one human being to another human being until Peter winds up at a city we know as Joppa. Now that's that's not the story that's in that's not the city that's in Star Wars. That's the city that's in the Bible. It's amazing how many biblical references amen are in those movies. Every time they say a city, I'm like, they stole that. Every time they talk about a planet, right? It's, it'll blow your mind. Watch this. God's been working in Simon. And Peter, this guy who, his name is Simon. Jesus comes, changes his name to Peter because it means rock. All this kind of stuff that's happened. He's been working in his life. Gets him to a city of Joppa. And of all of the houses Jesus would put him in contact with, he would put him in contact with a man who has a similar name than him, only he's a tanner. Simon the tanner. I'm going to read it in just a second. Guess what Simon does? He touches dead things. That's his job, touching dead things. Peter can't do that because he's a Jew. Can't touch dead things. It'll make me unholy. It'll make me unpure, right? And now I'm, I'm, God has brought me to a place to violate me. God has brought me to a place to where I'm conflicted about what's really going on. The very fact that Peter was willing to stay in the house of Simon the Tanner proves that God gradually is moving Peter away from his man-made legalistic attitude. And here's what I think is so cool about this. The very moment God is drawing Peter away from his prejudices, God is also drawing another man to himself by using Peter. Oh, you're not listening to me because, see, God wants to use you and you don't believe it. 
God wants to use you and you don't believe it. It's not about Pastor Don. Amen. It's not about the eldership team. It's about Firm Foundation Ministries being called into a special relationship with God and such a special relationship that we don't have the option, amen, to turn assignment into privilege. That's a sin. Let, let me introduce the vision to you. You ready? Watch verse 1. Now, in Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known in the Italian cohort, a devout or a devout, devote, whatever you want to say, a devout man who feared God with all his household. Interesting statement. He feared God. He gave alms generously. Uh-oh. Next week, we're going to talk about, get, hello, somebody. He gave alms generously to people and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision the angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius? He stared at him in terror and said, What is this, Lord? Maybe you don't read your Bible like I do. It's almost like he's actually saying, Is this you, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms, your prayers and your giving, your prayers and your generosity. Oh, see, I'm just telling you, one is attached to another. I'm setting you up. Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He's lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. And when the angel spoke to him and departed, he called two of his servants, a devout soldier among those who attended him, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now, briefly, I don't want to bore you with details, but I do love reading the scripture. And, and, and you'll hear Pastor Rick say it last week. He said the same thing. You've got to have a love for the word of God. Cornelius is not a he's not a difficult man to understand. As a matter of fact, I think he's a pretty simple guy, even though the context around him, you may think just casually reading is too, there's too much to figure out here. He he's just a he's just a member of a military regiment made up of freed men from Italy. What does that look like? Because of their service. Rome had given them citizenship. Now, in America, you're born in America, you're an automatic citizen, right? And because you didn't have to do anything for your citizenship, you take it for granted. They're actually citizens of the United States of America who know less about America than Eddie does when he had to study specifically to become a citizen and take a test. I am surprised to, at the day we live in at the lack of civics that Americans understand. Most people have no idea. It blows my mind that politicians get up and call us a democracy. We are not. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America For which it stands, right? The republic is there, isn't it? It doesn't say democracy, it says republic. We're a republic. If I hear one more politician get up and say, we're a democracy. It doesn't mean we aren't democratic. It just means in a republic, you elect officials who go and represent you. That's very important. That's the difference in the United States of America. But most citizens don't understand this. See, to be a citizen here, he had to prove it. He had to earn it. He couldn't just be a citizen. He had been given citizenship because of his service. That was very important. And it meant something to him. And so as a centurion, he would have commanded about 100 soldiers. That's easy to understand. And he's portrayed, which blows my mind, because he's a Roman citizen from Italy. 
You probably can't get more pagan than this. The Bible calls him, come on, a godly man, a devout man. He knows there's a God and he's seeking him. And we're told that he fears God and that he lives his life as if he's answerable to God. We're told that he's a generous man, one who gives to those in need. And we are told that he is a praying man. Now think about this for a minute because here is a man that is religious. He is sincere. He is prayerful, yet he's not saved. And so, so many people today in the world that we live in that think that uh, all you need in order to, be, to make it to heaven is to be religious, to be sincere, to be moral. I got news for you. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through him. Your religion will not get you to heaven. The Bible says that even our greatest efforts are as filthy rags. Y'all not listen to me this morning. Cornelius is a man who feared God, but he's not saved. In the society that you and I live in, especially in this culture that you and I live in, I tell this to people all the time, the difference is, you know, in this particular area, I'm always amazed at the heritage of church in people's lives. Whether people go to church today in our area or not, there is some church in their background. It's odd to meet someone like me who lived 20 years and never went to church a day in their life in our area. Whether people grew up Amish or Mennonite or, you know, some other kind of ite, I don't. There is this heritage of church inside of our lives in this area whether people have continued on in it just because that's what we do or people have outright grown up and left home and just rejected that and left it all together it is still that in our area there is this religious idea of those things Cornelius position his position points out clearly that one can have all of these things and still be lost and so an angel appears to him and tells him, listen, send down to Joppa. There's a man there. Uh, he's a little wild. He's a little crazy. Uh, you, you won't mistake him for anybody else. They didn't give him a Facebook picture. Hey, come on. How many times have you, someone told you, hey, do you know this person? I don't know this person. They're trying to explain this person to you, and you can't picture them in their mind. And all you do is go to Facebook, type in their name, and their picture comes up, and you go, oh, yeah, there they are. I know that person. No, nah, that didn't happen. There's no picture of Peter. If there was, it probably, amen. He says, there's a man named Peter. There's probably a lot of people named Peter. He's staying in the house of Simon. You'll know him. You'll know him. You'll know him. And I think his story, Cornelius' story, shares some light on a question for you and me as, as family members of this ministry. Now, again, this is our vision series, and so I'm speaking to us. What about the person who has never heard about Jesus Christ? What about the person who has lived up to the light that they have received, but has never heard about Jesus Christ? What happens to that person? What happens to Cornelius? You see, when he was obedient to the light he had, God saw to it that he received more light. I believe that it is safe to say that any person anywhere in the world who sincerely wants to be right with God, who is sincerely searching for the truth, can find it. God has ways you and I know nothing about of getting his words to those people who are truly seeking him. 
My wife's testimony, and if any of you haven't heard it, you should listen to it, is a testimony about how God himself sovereignly, sovereignly, when she was three years old, moved her from Thailand all the way to the United States of America and then worked for over 20 years to bring her to the spot where he would introduce himself to. If you don't think God will move you halfway around the earth and work for years to introduce himself to you, you don't know who he is. Because, see, to God, 20 years is nothing. God has ways that you and I have no idea about. We just think that someone, you know what I'm saying, has got to do what we think religiously has to do in order for them to know God. Listen, here, here's people ask me this all the time. People ask, can the lost be saved if they did not hear the gospel? It's a great question. I have a better question for Firm Foundation Ministry. Can we be saved if we don't deliver the gospel? The first question is a major on the minors. The first question gives me the ability to throw away my responsibility. The first question says I have privilege above assignment. It's not my fault that those people didn't hear the gospel. I heard the gospel. The last question flips assignment above privilege. How can we be saved? Now, now you hear me with your good ears because I'm not doubting your salvation. I know that the cross of Jesus Christ and his shed blood is a finished work and we don't need to add anything to it. But what I am saying to people who love Jesus, we are to love what Jesus loves. And Jesus loved the lost. And that we ought to have a passion for what he had a passion for. We should have a passion for preaching the gospel. And we should say, I intend to answer the first question with my assignment, not avoid it with my privilege. Mm -mm -mm. I like the last question better than the first one. When people always ask me that. And usually when people ask me that, it's not non-believers. It's believers themselves. What about that person in the jungles? You know there are unreached people group on planet Earth? Do you know there, are, are, there literally are people on planet Earth that have never been contacted by outside world, and the outside world has literally made it illegal to go contact them because if we do, we're probably going to kill them with our diseases. You can see this. There, there are people. How do they find God? How do they find God? Let's don't miss the point of the question with our self-centeredness, church. Let me introduce the vision. Go to Joppa. Now let me inspire the vision. Watch verse 9. The next day, as they were on the journey and approached the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. Now, I don't know. You can receive that how you want to. And in this, he saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. And in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Peter, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord. For I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Here's this vision of the sheet being lowered from heaven for several with several kinds of animals. Some considered it to be clean, some considered of the animals to be unclean. And, and, and have you ever, I don't know about you, but have you ever wondered why Peter was horrified over this picture? Have you ever wondered why Peter had an issue at the thought of killing and eating unclean animals? I'll put it this way. When I order a pizza from Little Louie's here in town, by the way, which is excellent. They, they, they're the best pizza. Little, little Louie's right here in town. I'm just telling you. 
it's a, it's, it's a pizza. And if you get the big dog, oh my. They load that thing up. Everything, man. They got pepperoni and sausage and cheese and, and, and they've got green peppers and, and they've, got, they've got black olives and they got green olives. And they got, I mean, they got everything. Now, I know sometimes we offer, we order a big pizza and some of you people are picky. I don't know what I was on my pizza. Pick them off. That's what we always say, right? If you don't like it, just pick it off. It's fine. It's fine. It'll be all right. Some of y'all need deliverance from just this cheese pizza issue you got. It's not of the Lord. It's not of the Lord. Put it on there. They're like, what do you want on your pizza? Whatever's over there. Put it on there. Put it in the oven. And I'm going to eat it. I don't like olives. Pick them off. Stop your whining. Here's what we need to understand. Why didn't Peter just do that? I, don't, I can't eat those unclean animals. It's against the Levitical law. It's a, it violates Deuteronomy. Hello, somebody. It violates the dietary law. I can't do that. I'm a Jew. I cannot eat those things. Well, just pick them off. Separate out the clean and the unclean. See, but for a Jew, what happened is once it got mingled, everything was unclean. And I just want to violate you this morning. I'm sorry about you not liking olives. When they cook olives on a pizza, you can pick it off if you want to. It still tastes like olives. Because the juices are all in there. So you're still eating olives. Jesus would have ate olives on his pizza. I mean, after all, he, you know, the Mount of Olives is where pizza was originated from. I don't know. Like, I don't know what happened. This is not in my notes. Is he, uh, Peter's upbringing says, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. His response to God's command was, not so, Lord. Not going to do it. I've ne- I'm a been a good boy. I have never eaten anything that was common or clean. I have never, I have never, I have never, I have never. I, I am known by what I don't do. Y'all never heard Tim's Carpenter's sermon all those years ago? You missed one. It was for the ages. Sick of being known for what I didn't do. Peter was proud of the fact that he'd never done certain things. And we, we have our own similar form of legalism and righteousness that sometimes we allow to divine ourselves by the things we don't do. I never do that. Are there some things Pastor Don doesn't do? Absolutely. Not going to do it. That's my conviction. And I tell the men in our discipleship group all the time, I'm not going to ask you to live my convictions, but if you're going to be a man, I'm going to expect you to find some convictions and live by them. Stop being a little boy. Time to grow up. Little boys don't have any convictions. Men have convictions. And don't tell me you have a conviction and then don't live by it. Don't tell me you have a conviction and then sacrifice that conviction because you happen to be in a room who, of people who don't carry that conviction. My convictions are mine before the Lord. And they might violate you. And I can't apologize. You know what? Sometimes I want to fight because sometimes somebody needs to be punched in the face. In the name of Jesus. It's my conviction. Don't freak out. I haven't punched anybody in the face in years. I didn't say I hadn't wanted to. I prayed in the Spirit. Uh, You ever read David's Psalms when he prayed? You know what he asked the Lord? Hey, Lord, punch him in the mouth and knock her teeth out. See, that's a prayer I can pray. I'm going to get emails. I know it. 
Uh, listen, little kids, don't go punch nobody. Don't do that, because what's going to happen is you can tell your teachers, and at all, I'm going to get helloed somebody. Don't do that. Don't do that. All the teachers are saying yes. Come on, help me out. All right, Don did not, Pastor Don did not give, I said I wanted to, but then I prayed in the spirit. I don't want to be proud of the things I don't do. I don't want to make what I don't do the limit of my relationship with God. There are, there's nothing wrong with not doing certain things. But there's everything wrong with defining our spirituality with it. We heard Pastor Rick joke last week. I don't know if you heard it. He said, you know, I don't cuss, I don't drink, I don't smoke, and I don't chew, and I don't run with those who do. Hello, somebody. I said that different to the, the, the intern boys last year. I was like, look, man, you can't hang out with girls who drink, smoke, and chew. Like if she's dipping snuff and it's running down her cheek, you probably don't need to date her. Probably not, probably not good. Let me tell you something. The church or the world, the lost world is not impressed by what we don't do. They are not. They are not impressed by what we don't do. What non-Christians are looking for is a Christian who's able to live a life that's beyond the capability of what they are able to live. What impresses non-believers is to find homes that are filled with loving acceptance of one another, right? Homes that are characterized by warmth and joy and peace in the middle of a world where homes are falling apart on every side. What impresses non-believers is that when you should be falling apart, you are not because God is holding you together. That's what impresses non-believers. Let me inspire you by the vision. The Lord's response to Peter is this vision, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. There's a far greater implication, church, than simply what Peter was not allowed to eat. He, he's regarding certain people as unclean and people to be avoided. And God is revealing to him that forgiving sinners is, is the first priority for what we are called to do. We are called the four corners of a sheet. The earth. He shows him something that's impressive. Four corners represent the four corners of the earth. It encompasses the whole thing. Hello, somebody. I know what all you flat earthers are thinking right now. See? Flat. <laughs> you have no idea the things that go through my mind when I'm writing a sermon. You have no idea. All right, I'm moving along because I want to be done here in a minute. The sheet's contents indicate millions of people that made up Peter's world. And I wonder if when the Lord was showing him this vision, that if Peter remembered back at Matthew uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 17 through 23, I'll read it to you. When he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable, and he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. And he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blaspheme, pride, and foolishness. All these evils come from within and defile a man. I wonder if when this sheet is there before Peter and the Lord says to Peter, do not call what I have called clean common. I wonder if his mind goes back to that conversation with Jesus. When Jesus says, don't you get it? You're so religious. You're worried about your privilege. 
You worried about getting dirty. You worried about your privilege getting violated. You're forgetting your assignment. I love it. And so Peter tells Cornelius, verse 28, it's so cool, right? Right? It, it, being near pagans is not the problem. Being like pagans is the problem. Uh-oh. I said that being near pagans is not the problem. Being like pagans is the problem. My wife and I are watching a, a series. I'm not going to tell you the name of the series or whatever, but it's a historical series, and it's about King Alfred in England when the Vikings were attacked. And uh, there is a, a Viking by the name of uh, Gurdon, Gurdonsum. He's a lead Viking. And uh, he has invaded England. And, and, and him and Alfred are battling back and forth. They're, they're two armies or whatever. And as uh, Gertrude continues to take uh, land, he also, th that land is full of cathedrals and churches. And, and every time he sets up shop inside of a different church, there is a new revelation of the one God versus his pagan gods. And he wears Thor's hammer, and he has all of these pagan gods that belong to him. But he keeps hearing the message of this one God, this one God, this one God, this one God. And over and over and over throughout the whole film, uh, you see him asking a lot of questions. And, and pretty soon, the truth of the matter is, uh, Guthrum comes to give his heart and life to Christ and get baptized and then take Alfred's side. It's a great story. It's a historical moment. It actually hip happened. We were looking it up on Wikipedia. All of it happened, and his name gets changed and all these things. Why? Because he came in contact with an enemy who was so committed to his God that even his enemy was using everything he could to witness to him about the one living God, King Alfred. It's a great story because Alfred and the rest of the priests were not worried about being unclean with the Vikings. They were every opportunity, even if it cost them their life. They would still share God. Peter says to Cornelius, um, it's considered unlawful for me to hang out with Jews. Do you know actually there's no Old Testament law that prohibits the association? None. None. It was just a Jewish custom. It was just a Jewish practice. It was a man-made idea about how to be legalistically clean. It was a custom and practice that Jesus commanded his disciples to set aside. Why? Because the world is desperately in need of God's people. All God had to do now was prepare someone to share the gospel with Cornelius. When he, when he looked at this, when you look at this story, see, it's hard. I'm going to tell you something. It is harder to get someone prepared to witness than it is to get someone ready to listen. Yeah. You might want to take a picture of that. It is harder to get someone prepared to witness than it is to find someone who's ready to listen. I wonder if more people are ready to listen to the gospel in mine and your life today in this community than there are people who are ready to share. That's Pastor Don's job. That's the elder's job. It's their job to win people to Christ. I'm not, I'm not denying my responsibility. I'm on mission. I'm not an evangelist. I'm a pastor, but I'm still building relationships with people who don't know Jesus. And I'm hanging out with those people. And you know what? On purpose, I create a list every year at the beginning of the year. 20 families that I know. This year it's aggressive. Last year it was 10. This year it's 20 families that I know that don't go to church and don't have a relationship with Jesus. And on purpose, I'm going to build a relationship with them. Last year I did 10. Five of those families now have a relationship with Jesus and are part of this church. Just like that. Where's your list? Why is that? Come on. Where's your list? Who do you know? You can see, see, that proves to me that it's harder to get people ready to witness than it is to get people ready to listen. I'm not an evangelist, but I win people to Christ. Come on. Let me give you the interpretation of the vision so we can go home. 
The, the, the vision left Peter wondering what in the world God was trying to tell him. Watch verse 17 here. It's so good. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that had seen that might mean, behold, the men who were set by Cornelius, having uh, made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out, asked where Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I've sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What's the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, an upright, God-fearing man, who, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guest. He invited them in to be his guest. Note how perfectly God dovetails the working of Cornelius, working in Cornelius' life to working in Peter's life. See, you think, you think that just because you're a Christian that God has done working on you. But you know what? I have learned more about my personal relationship with God by teaching others to have a personal relationship with God than I ever have sitting in a rooms reading a book. Watch this. While Peter was praying and seeing a vision, men from Cornelius were approaching the city. While Peter was still confused about the meaning of what he's seeing, they're arriving. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit says, they're here. Don't hesitate. And when Peter went down and introduces himself, they explained to him that why they were here. And it's important that Peter invite these men into the house where they must have shared a meal and spent the night together. Oh, boy. It's obvious to me that barriers are coming down. Now, I'm going to need you to pay attention in the last minute or two here because this is very important to why I'm saying what I'm saying today. When the Lord shows us some new truths, He always gives us an opportunity to act on what we've learned. When the Lord shows us a new truth, he always gives us an opportunity to act on what we learn. The truth is, when God challenges our heart, he often provides circumstances that call us up into the principles that he's working on us with. John Hostetter, who, who's on the trip, uh, him and I have been having a conversation this week back and forth about prayer, fasting. And those particular things. And, and we were talking about, you know, just even some of the things we're frustrated in and those type of things like why, wh what's going on with this and how is this and how come I'm frustrated in prayer and those things. And I, and I said to him again, I said, brother, this is exactly why I say that oftentimes I believe that prayer changes me more than it changes things. Not my will be done, but yours, Lord. Like, oftentimes, my time with the Lord isn't about uh, getting what I want as much as it is about getting His heart postured into my life. And God changes my views of things. But see, this is why we don't want to pray, because we don't want to be changed. The truth is that when God challenges our heart, He often provides circumstances that call on us to put those principles into practice. When the Lord reveals His truth to us, He's providing opportunities, church. We, we should expect them, FFM, and accept them as gifts. When the unanswerable question comes, here is my question to you. Instead of living in fear and doubt about it, why do we not believe that even if I don't understand what's happening, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is involved in the details of it? As long as I walk this earth, I can't preach your story, I can only preach mine, so just go with it. As long as I walk this earth, I will never understand why Camden died. My three-year-old grandson. I will never understand it. But the one thing that I do know is that my God is so involved that he's involved in every detail of it. 
Hello, somebody. Therefore, there are some things I don't need to understand. In that, what God is teaching me is I need to learn to trust His sovereignty more. There are some things that I don't understand. You guys know our marriage ministry and coming in July, our marriage sermon series is coming. Get ready for it. Get yourself prepared for it. I'm going to say things that will violate everybody and those type of things. It's fine. You'll get over it. But as long as I walk this earth, I will never understand why people get divorced. There is nothing that's happened in marriage that cannot be forgiven if we are Christians. But does it happen? Do I condemn and criticize those people who it has happened to? No, because God is involved in the details. He is involved in the details. I need to trust his sovereignty. This, I will, there are some things I will never understand, and I will never have an answer that will make your heart go, well, okay, good. If that's the answer, then that makes it okay. There's nobody who's going to come up to me and say, here's the answer as to why Camden died, and I'm going to be able to look at him and go, well, if that's the answer, then I'm good with it. People told me one time, you'll get over it in time, Pastor Don. I don't want to get over it. I want to be healed by it. I want to trust God more through it. I don't want to act like it never happened. It doesn't rob my joy. I'm learning to trust God's sovereignty. And Camden, like an arrow, is still being released from the bow of God. It's God's business, not mine. We should accept them as gifts. What is God doing? He's involved in the details. I don't understand it. I will never understand it. My job is to pray and trust God. Pray and trust God. Pray and trust God. There are times like Johnny Blake told us from England as a group of men, there are times when you've got to close the door, climb the mountain, and pray. What God speaks is God's business. You don't get to dictate what God speaks as you climb the mountain. Abraham is climbing the mountain with his only son, knowing what God has asked him. He's got to be fighting that the whole way. This is not fair. He's my only son. This violates your promise, God. You said that this would be a promise and that it would grow. Now I've got to kill him. I don't understand it. And even when Isaac realized it himself, hey, we've got the knife, we've got the fire, we've got the wood, Dad. We're going to make a sacrifice. We forgot something, Pops. Hey, Pops, we forgot the sacrifice. I got the wood and the knife. You got the fire. We got everything we need. We didn't bring anything to sacrifice, Pops. In his mind, Abraham's going, yes, we did. Isaac doesn't know it. Where's the sacrifice, Dad? And Abraham says to his son, God will provide for himself. Oh, y'all not understanding this. See, God has given Firm Foundation Ministries a vision, right? And we can sit around all the days and we can look at all the things that we don't have in order to accomplish those visions. But I'm here to tell you as your pastor, I'm here to tell you as your lead elder, you don't doubt your God because he will provide for himself. If it's his vision, he will provide. He will provide. I want to encourage you with this vision. I want to encourage you. Let me, let me encourage you with this thing. It's so important. Verse 24, watch this. It's so good. And the following day, they entered Caesar, uh, uh, entered Caesar area. Cornelius was expecting them. And he called them together as well as his close friend. And when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down on his feet and worshipped him. But Peter said, uh, 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 uh. stand up. I'm just a man like you. When he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathering. He said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate or to visit anyone other than the nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean so that when I was sent forth, I came without objection. Not entirely true. <laughs> he objected before he understood the revelation. And I asked then... Why you sent me? Now watch this. I want you to grab this. 
when Peter arrives, he, uh, Cornelius falls at his feet. Peter says, no, 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 don't do this. Right? It's inappropriate. And so Peter refuses to be treated as a god or to treat Cornelius as if he is a dog. First, I want you to understand that it was prayer, focusing on God, on the part of both Peter and Cornelius, that made them receptive to God's leading. In the Western world, prayer is the thing that lacks the most in the church. I cannot tell you, I, I can't tell you, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this because this is my experience, not yours. But 100% of the time, those people who have come up to me and says, Pastor Don, I'm called to intercessory prayer are the people who give up on prayer the, the most. They'll be the people when I look around aren't at the prayer meeting. We're all called to intercessory prayer. You don't get to use that as some way to shuck another responsibility. Oh, it got quiet. Let's see, the amen or old me right there. We celebrated the moving of God because a group of people were committed to praying for one thing. We've been praying for a year. We've been praying for a year on Tuesdays, just praying, just praying, just praying. I'm just telling you right now, there are some times in prayer on Tuesday mornings when I think I'm, I'm going to have to get the defibrillator out for Mr. Tim Hall. Because <laughs> he's going to town. I'm like, Lord, don't let that old man die during a prayer meeting. But I guess that's a good way to go. You keep praying, Mr. Hall. Prayer, it's there. I want you to understand prayer, focusing on God, right? Verses 5 and 9, it's the part both Peter and Cornelius made them receptive to what God is doing. See, is your prayer life strong enough that God can use it to guide you and give you directions? I find myself better or worse based on praying more or less. You know why I'm going to Florida? Because I want to sit in that room and pray. It's my prayers that are going to punch the devil in the face. The church kind of frowns on me doing it physically. Although Doug was with me one night when we confronted a husband who had hit his wife, and, and uh, I, I threatened him pretty good. And Doug said, Oh, you can't do that, Pastor Don. I said, You shush. I'm dealing with him. You hit her one more time. And I'm not going to give you a chance to hit me. I'm just going to deck you. I'm going to hit her. She's God's daughter. I got a daughter. My son-in-law hits my daughter. I ain't asking any questions. Well, I'll take whatever punishment the elders give me. He's going to have a dotted eye. And I told him as much. Preacher, no Preacher. I almost went to jail because a girl, a guy violated my daughter when he was dating. I mean, it's like, the priest, the cop told me, he said, I should take you to jail. I know what you should do. We graduated the police academy together. But if you give me just a minute, I'll make it worth both our whiles. <laughs> Preacher, he said, you're a pastor. I ain't got pastor's hat on. I got daddy's hat on. Now I've gotten older and wiser. Somebody say, thank God. But I hadn't got less Pentecostal, and I do like laying hands on people, so. And some of y'all get that later. Don't get all violated. I'm going to get so many emails. They're going to be so fun. I'm going to sit on a plane, and I'm just going to laugh. It'll be hilarious. I find myself better or worse when I pray more or less. I'm not a violent man. Please don't walk away from here and see that. I'm just saying, now I let... My prayers do the punching. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is us, church. The Bible says that the kingdom of God suffereth violence, but the violent take it by. Are you praying? Are you punching the devil in the mouth? When the devil's after your kids, are you punching him in the mouth? Come on. When the devil's after your marriage, are you punching him in the mouth? When the devil's after your health, are you punching him in the mouth? No, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. Because you're whining. You're not praying. 
Push that plate away. Push that food away. Declare a fast. Isaiah says, has this not the fast that I have declared to break the chains of the assignments of the pits of hell? Am I not after the enemy? Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That means the body of Christ should be on the move. We should be the aggressors. Sit around and let the devil steal our church, steal our ministry, steal our families, steal our kids. Regardless of what we see, we should go to prayer. It works with mathematical precision. Secondly, secondly, the vision that changed the world began by changing one man. Peter's attitude was changed, although, although he was still a little rough around the edges. And that's all right. I, I, a man who's not roughed around the edges is a man that I am curiously, curiously apprehensive about. I'm just going to tell you. Uh, I love the Lord Jesus Christ with all my heart. And, and Pastor Rick was right. I was born jumping into the Spirit. I'm changed. I love Jesus, but I'm still rough. Hello, somebody. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. She'll just look at me sometimes and go, you, right now you need some Jesus. And she is right. <laughs> Come here, Anne Renee. This, this handkerchief, this napkin, not only do I believe it will change your life, I believe it will change this ministry. Because here's my challenge in our 2020 vision. Right now, there are people in your life Who have wounded you so much that if God came and audibly spoke to you and said go tell them I love them you would not do it nay Lord not my job there are people right now because of social status maybe even color of skin God forgive us all do you know that I actually had a Christian man tell me when I was a young believer that I would not be able to go to heaven because I was interracially married? I, that was said to me. And you know what I said to him? I'm afraid that one of us in this room should be worried about not going to heaven and it ain't me there are two races on planet earth two those who are God's people and saved and those who are not you had better forgive your prejudices against people that are different color than you you better do it there are people right now that you think you shouldn't associate with. There are things that when I get up and talk about going to the nations that you would say, oh, we got enough problems in America, Pastor Don. We shouldn't go to the nations. We should stay here. There are people. There are people in your life that right now, if God spoke to you, you would do the same thing that Peter said and go, no, not my responsibility, not my issue. I'm not doing it. I double dog dare you to go home today, find a napkin, write the names of those people on a napkin. Write the nations of those people. Write those people on this napkin that you would not tell about the love of Jesus Christ. And I promise you, it will change your life. Because God will speak to you and say, what I have made clean, do not call unclean. I, 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 hey, I'm with you, okay? Okay. I, I, don't, I don't have unforgiveness for anybody. Are there people that I don't want to go on vacation with? Yeah. But at the same time, if God tells me, hello, somebody, 
I, 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 dare, I dare you do it. I dare you do it. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a preacher in your life who hurt you. Maybe, maybe there's a, a, a person in your life who violated you. Maybe there's someone who abused you. Maybe there's someone who threw you away. Maybe there's people you don't think are deserving of the love of God. I want you to write them, I want you to write them down. I want you to write them down. Maybe the, why don't we write some nations that we don't think are worthy of the love of God, like uh, maybe some Muslim nations. Why should we tell them Jesus loves us, loves them? They want to kill us. They chant death to America. Why should we do that? So they'll stop chanting death to America. I've met some converted Muslims. I've gone to a meeting where they only speak Farsi. I've gone to a meeting where the church full of Muslims, uh, asylum seekers, and uh, this redneck American preach the gospel to Iranian Muslims. Y'all know Iran and America don't get along? Y'all probably didn't know that. But it's the governments that don't like each other. And I remember giving an altar call and one by one those Muslims pulling off their headphones because someone was in the back translating into Farsi and coming to the altar to give their heart and life to Jesus. I couldn't even pray for them. We had to have Farsi translators come down and pray for them. I remember preaching the gospel where Muslims gave their heart and life to Jesus Christ. But they would probably be on somebody's napkin. See, you need to remove your politics and you need to reinvigorate your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's so, it's so, it's so quiet. The problem is that we can't just be selective about those who are willing to share the gospel with. We can't. God said, no, 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 no. Don't do it. Finally. Don't forget that when God shows us some new truth, he will give us an opportunity to act on what we have learned. Will you stand with me? Now. In 1996, when Art Good ordained me in Florida... Uh, many, many of you in this room, raise your hand if you know Art Good. Many, many of you will know our Pastor Art. Um, we hope to have him here this year. Um, he gave me a prophetic word, and he said to me, he said, you will pastor an international church. Now, I'm a redneck boy. I ain't leaving the South. Amen? No, we still fighting that war. Much less, now I've got to go to the nations and pastor a church in a different country. But over the years, God gave me a vision, and I would have dreams, and I would see this place as it is right now. And you can ask my wife, because you know she won't lie to you. I would wake up, and I would tell her about what I'd seen. And I said, I, I see people of color. I see people of different nationalities. I see people, and, and I had forgotten those dreams. Until one year, Marissa King and Anne Renee did Advent for us, and we did Christmas around the world during Advent. And we found out and discovered something we had not paid attention to, that at that time there was about some 14, 14 different nations represented in our little bitty church. And God gave that dream back to me. Bang, remember the words I spoke to you in 96. It's Centerville, y'all. See, I'm not preaching to the church down the road right now. I'm preaching to us. I'm talking about our vision this month, who we are, why we're doing what we're doing, why discipleship is important, why we're winning the lost, because you got to win them to send them, why the prophecy about being in Antioch is important, about planting churches, why all of this is so, so important to what we're doing. It's not enough to just be a member of a church because, see, God is calling us to so much more than that. See, this napkin right here, some of y'all are going to have to put your spouse's name on it. Some of y'all are going to have to put your kids' names on it. I promise you, those who will do it, I guarantee you God will do a miracle for you. I, I know he will because that's how God works. Those of you who don't think it's a big deal and don't do it, you won't see anything and you'll, you'll, you'll see, see, I told you that preacher was wrong. No, you didn't do anything. Just keep wandering in the wilderness. You'll come back around to that same rock in a little bit. God provides circumstance that call us into the principles he's teaching us. And, and we need to expect that and welcome at church. We have so many people to reach. 
We do. We got to win them to send them. You see, Pastor Don, I'm, I'm not in the mood here to say, I just want to win people so we can have a large church. See, I don't think our church is that big. I think our vision is that big. Because everyone we win, we are looking at. Do we send them or do they replace somebody else we're sending? Come on. It's always this principle. It's always this principle. It's always this principle. I challenge you to take a napkin and let's watch God do what only He can do. Amen? Let Him speak. Let Him speak to us. I believe it with all my heart that God has called us into so much. Next week, I'm going to challenge you about why giving is so important. You know, I preach one message a year on giving. One. So if you're a visitor and you think that's what they do, they always talk about money. No, I only do it once a year. Amen. And I was going to skip it this year, but one of the elders told me, no. His name's Matt Stutzman, so you can blame him. As an act of solidarity, again, will you grab the hand of the person next to you because we're in this together? Jesus, we committed to this napkin, this sheet. Forgive us, Lord, for calling unclean what you have decided to call clean. Forgive us, Lord, for not believing God in the mission. God, forgive us for the times when we have Uh, Lord, let privilege override assignment. Um, Help us, God, to be a people who say, thank God for my salvation and that I'm going to heaven. But help us to be a people who are not just satisfied with going to heaven. The church, church was born on earth because you have a work to do here. Help us to be agents of the kingdom, ambassadors with embassies to work out of. God, as we write names on these napkins and we fold them up and we pray over them, will you do what only you can do with those relationships? Will you do what only you can do with those wounds and those miracles? God, would you do what only you can do with those prejudices? And God, we pray that our church would be like a net cast out into the ocean that is indiscriminate about the fish that it catches. Bring us people from all nations, all tongues, so that we might have influence and understanding about those cultures in such a way that we could preach the gospel to them. Lord, we pray these things as we embrace your vision, as we renew our vision to who you are. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. All right, here's what I'm going to ask you to do as you leave. Make sure you greet uh, those that uh, the Lord is releasing from us. Tell them how much you love them and get some contact information. Greet the Carters. uh, Be excited about what God done there. God bless you. Amen. We'll see you Wednesday night.